Hi, this lesson is all about the modes of emplacement of igneous rocks, and in particular, looking at intrusive igneous rocks. I'll explain a little bit more about what that is in a moment. For those of you that did GCSE, this should be largely familiar, but I'm going to start from scratch anyway. You'll need this handout. This was uh, a small slip of paper included in your packs. Uh, stick this in the middle of a, uh, a larger page so that you can add some annotation uh, around it. What we're looking to do is identify which features here are uh, the different types of igneous intrusion. Igneous rocks on this diagram are shaded in grey. Okay, let's have a look at what we're talking about. There are two what we call modes of emplacement. Modes of emplacement are how an igneous rock gets to where we find it. And they can form really in one of two different settings. Firstly, uh, intrusive igneous rock. This is where magma cools beneath the surface, where the rock is intruded or injected, if you like, into the country rock. Country rock is a very general term that we use for any of the rocks surrounding the igneous rock. The second mode of emplacement is extrusive igneous rocks. This is where the magma cools on the surface. So this would uh, be the products of volcanic eruptions, like lava, for example. Now, in this video, I want us to focus particularly on the intrusive igneous rocks. Okay. For the intrusive igneous rocks, there's a few features that they have in common. They're often, for example, very coarse-grained. Uh, they cool slowly, uh, well insulated beneath the Earth's surface, perhaps in rocks that are already fairly warm, so the crystals have time to grow, so they're, they're relatively coarse. The key feature of intrusive igneous rocks, the, the key thing that we need to be able to recognise, is uh, the shape that they uh, form in, and their relationship uh, with the country rock that surrounds them. And it's that that we need to focus on in this lesson. Now, there are lots of different types of intrusion. Lopoliths, phacoliths, uh, lacoliths. But we really only need to worry about three. And for those that did GCSE, it's the same three that we did for that. The three we need to know are dikes, sills, and plutons. So what I want us to do is look at the features of each of these and try to um, identify what uh, differentiates them, what how we can tell them apart. Okay, you've got a, a diagram uh, similar to this I suppose. Let's just sort out some of the language because we don't talk about um, old-fashioned terms like batholiths anymore, we use the word pluton. Okay, let's start with dikes. Uh, dike, on this diagram I'm afraid misspelled uh, in the American way, a dike is uh, a, like a slab of igneous rock, a sheet-like body, and as you can see from this diagram, it cuts across the country rock. Now we describe that as being discordant. So that uh, you can see that the dike there uh, isn't, isn't at the same angle as the layers within the country rock. If we contrast that with a sill, you'll see a sill is also sheet-like. It's also a, a slab of igneous rock. But this time it's what we call concordant. It follows the layering within the country rock. Now, it doesn't matter what angle the country rock might be inclined at. If it cuts across it, 
it's a dike. If it follows it, it's a sill. The final type of intrusion then are the plutons. Now plutons are large and irregular. They're, they're crystallized magma chambers and they cut across the country rock. But it's their size and this irregularity of shape that um, makes them uh, into plutons. Plutons can be ranging size from maybe several hundred meters across up to tens of kilometers across. Let's have a look at some examples. We'll start with a dike. We can see in this photograph of the foreshore that running down the middle of this is a structure that doesn't follow the rest of the um, the beds that we can see exposed. Here it is. This is a dike. If we actually went there um, in the field, we'd be able to identify this as an igneous rock. You can see that it's a sheet-like body. And we can see where the layers in the country rock are at the back there. And that this uh, dike is discordant with that country rock. It's cutting across it. A sill is a little more subtle. I've labelled it up here because it's not perhaps immediately obvious where it is. This darker coloured band with these vertical structures in them called columnar joints shows us that it's an igneous rock. And you can see that this slab of igneous rock uh, follows the layering we can see in the rest of the cliff. So we get a sheet-like body. This time, though, it's concordant with those layers. It follows those layers. Now, plutons are quite tricky things to take photos of. They're, they're usually really quite large. This is a relatively small pluton and uh, probably one of the most spectacular ones in the world. This is a place called Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Now, Devil's Tower uh, is... A, uh, a pluton made of igneous rock. The, the rock you can see sticking out there uh, is all igneous. Yet, this one sticks out you know, quite dramatically in the landscape because of the nature of the country rock. If we look at how it formed, the magma was intruded uh, in this large irregular shape, cutting across the country rock into some really soft fairly recent sedimentary rocks. Devil's Tower isn't a particularly old structure. Those soft igneous rock, uh, sedimentary rocks, sorry, eroded away fairly uh, quickly, fairly easily, leaving the much harder igneous rock uh, standing proud of the landscape. So we see the feature that we uh, see for miles around today. Just to give you some idea of the scale here, if you look at the columnar joints that run vertically down the side of Devil's Tower, these are a particular challenge for, for rock climbers. And you can see how scaling these, uh, these columns of rock uh, is, is quite challenging. Now, igneous intrusions get injected into the country rock through a process we call stoping. This diagram, well this cartoon really, tries to uh, illustrate how stoping works. The magma here is, is rising, it's, it's, it's pushing its way upwards through the crust. As it does, it works its way into weaknesses in the country rock and forces blocks of the country rock uh, to break off and fall down through the magma. Now, the reason it rises is because, well, firstly, the magma is buoyant. It's lower density than the country rocks surrounding it. This liquid is also under pressure. The gas dissolved in it is trying to expand. It's trying to make the magma bigger. That will force it upwards and outwards into these weaknesses uh, surrounding 
the magnet. And those weaknesses give it away and it will exploit any weaknesses in the rock. The result of this is the magma will force its way up, it will rise. And we do see evidence of this uh, in igneous rocks, evidence of this process called stoping. We can find blocks of country rock that have fallen into the magma. Here we can see a dark um, piece of country rock that's fallen into a much lighter coloured granite. These types of rocks are called xenoliths, which literally means foreign rock. But this is going to be the subject of a uh, homework um, shortly. So I'm, I'm not going to get into that particularly in this lesson. There are some other features we can see within the igneous rock that gives a clue about how it forms. This is uh, at the contact, the edge of the igneous rock where it comes into contact with the country rock that surrounds it. Here we've got a granite um, labelled up and a much darker country rock. But between the two, well actually within the granite itself, you can see there's a, a zone that looks different from the main part of the granite. This zone is called a chilled margin. You can see that the crystals are finer in that chilled margin. They've cooled more quickly as heat is lost to the surrounding country rock. This is an important feature in recognising the relationship between igneous intrusions and the country rock. We can see it on all sorts of different scales. This is uh, an example of a very small intrusion uh, in Canada. You can see the coin uh, there for scale. Now, this small intrusion was clearly uh, intruded into a, a cold country rock. And perhaps because of its size, it cooled very, very quickly. If you look at the top and bottom of the intrusion, which is where the, the, uh, where the coin's sitting on, you can see there's this dark, shiny layer. That's the chilled margin of this small intrusion. And it cooled so quickly, it's formed a volcanic glass. It's formed obsidian, as the uh, magma has, has pretty much instantly cooled in contact. So, if we look at your diagram, which I'm hoping you've been annotating as we went. We have A and B here which are volcanic vents. A of course could be interpreted as well as a uh, as a dike, although if it's um, more of a sort of pipe-like structure rather than a sheet, it, it will be a volcanic vent. C and D represent sills. D shows us what a sill would be like if it's exposed at the surface, see if it's still uh, under the surface. E and F are plutons. F would be like uh, the Devil's Tower, as we've just seen. E is as the pluton would be, large and irregular, and cutting across the, the country rock beneath the surface. We don't need to worry about G and H. These are a... a an intrusion called a lacolith that isn't on our syllabus. J, though, is a dike, cutting across the country rock in this sheet-like body. And if it reaches the surface, it creates a fissure eruption, like we see in Iceland, typically. So your sheet should have these labels and more. It should include some annotation to explain why each of these intrusions are what they are, how we can recognise them. So, as the sun sets over Devil's Tower, we can recognise that igneous intrusions are easily identifiable by looking at the shape of the intrusion and its relationship with the country rock. They're a common feature both in geology and in the exams. And it's really important that we know how to 
identify and interpret these structures. There'll be a study task for you to have a go at this, but that's for another lesson. I'll see you then.